Suffering saints have insights into the methods and mysteries of Satan's temptations. To singular advantage, the suffering saints have by their suffering. Insights into the methods and mysteries of Satan's temptations. Some of those wiles of Satan opened. The hazards and dangers of Christians in times of persecution arise not so much from their sufferings as from the temptations that always attend them and are by Satan planted upon their sufferings. For the most part, sufferings and temptations go together, and therefore it behooves such as are, or expect to be called to sufferings, to dive into the mysteries of temptations and be well acquainted with the enemy's designs upon them. So was Paul. And so he supposes all others to be that engage in the same cause. We are not ignorant of his devices. Second Corinthians 2 verse 11 there is a manifold advantage redounding to suffering saints by this. He that is well acquainted with the methods of temptation will be better able to descry the first approaches and beginnings of it. And the temptation discovered is more than half conquered. It is a special artifice of Satan to shuffle in his temptations as undiscernibly as may be into the soul. For he knows that in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird, Proverbs 1, verse 17. And therefore he ordinarily makes a suffering season to be a tempting season. Because sufferings, like fire to iron, make it impressive and operable. They do ordinarily put the soul into an hurry and distraction. And so gives him an advantage to tempt the soul with less suspicion and greater success. But now a skillful Christian that is acquainted with his wiles will discern when he begins to enter into temptation, as Christ's expression is in Luke 22, verse 46. And so, check the temptation in its first rising, when it is weakest and most easily broken. Doubtless one reason why so many fall by temptation is because it has gotten within them, and has prevailed far before it be discovered to be a temptation. Number two, he that is well acquainted with Satan's methods of tempting, will not only discern it sooner than another, but also knows his work and duty and how to manage the conflict with it, which is a great manner. There are many poor souls that labor under strong temptations and know not what to do. They go up and down complaining from Christian to Christian, whilst the judicious Christian plies to the throne of grace with strong cries, keeps up his watch, countermines the temptation by assaulting that corruption, by endeavors of mortification which Satan assaults by temptation. Lastly, to name no more, he that is best acquainted with the mystery of temptation, and can maintain his ground against it, he shall be the, he shall be the persevering Christian under persecutions, and the victorious Christian over them. Here lies the main design of Satan, in raising persecution against the saints. It is not so much their bloody thirsts after, as their fall by temptation. And all persecutions are designed by him to introduce his temptations. These work upon our fear, and fear drives us into his trains and snares. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The devil's work in raising persecution is but as the fowler's work in beating the bush in the night, when the net is spread to take the birds which he can affright out of their coverts. He that understands that is not easily moved by the strongest opposition from his place and duty. And so it's like to prove the most constant and invincible Christian in times of persecution. Oh then, how necessary is it that since all persecutions are intended as means to promote temptation, and have skill and insight into these designs of Satan so advantages as to frustrate his designs in both? I say, how necessary is it that you should be all instructed in which the strength of temptation lies? It's also how to resist those strong and dangerous temptations which your sufferings only are intended to usher in and make way for. It will not be unreasonable or impertinent then in this chapter to show you first in what the force and efficacy of temptation lies. Secondly, what you are to do when in a suffering hour such temptations shall assault you. And what does the efficacy and power of temptation lie? I answer it lies principally in three things. One, in the kind and nature of the temptation. Two, in the craft and policy of Satan in managing it. Three, in that secret correspondency that Satan has with our corruptions. 
First, it lies in the kind of nature of the temptation itself, for it is most certain that all temptations are not alike forcible and dangerous. Some are ordinarily more successful than others, and such as these that follow. Strange and unusual temptations. I don't mean such as none have been troubled with before us, for there is not a dart in Satan's quiver, but has been let fly at the breasts of other saints before it was leveled at ours. But by strange and unusual, I mean such as the people of God are but rarely troubled with, and possibly we were never exercised with before. These are the more dangerous because they daunt and amaze the soul and ordinarily beget despondency, even as some strange disease would do that we know not what to make of, nor can learn that others have been sick of. 2. Mark them for most dangerous temptations that are adapted and suited to your proper sin or evil constitution. For certainly that is the most dangerous crisis of temptation when it tries a man there. Now if he be not truly gracious, he falls by the root irrevocably. Luke 22, verses 5 and 6. Or if sincere, yet without special assistance and extraordinary vigilance, he falls scandalously. Number 3. When it is a spiritual temptation which rises undiscernibly out of the Christian's duties. This is, alas, suspected, because temptation usually come from the strength and liveliness of corruptions, but this from the slaughter and conquest we make of them. Duties and enlargements in them, which are the poison of other lusts, prove the food and fuel of this, and how much the more covert and close any temptation is, by so much the more dangerous it is. Secondly, the strength and efficacy of temptation lies much in the skill and policy of Satan and the management of it. And hence they are called wiles, methods, and devices, Second Corinthians 2, verse 11, and himself an old serpent, Revelation 12, verse 9. And among the rest of his deep and desperate stratagems, these following are remarkable. First, in employing such instruments to manage his temptations as are least suspected and have the greatest influence, a teacher, Galatians 2, 14, a wife, Genesis 3, verse 6, and Job 2, verse 9, Friends, Acts 21, verse 13. The devil knows it is a bad business and therefore must make the best of it. Paul Soros' trial was by his dearest friends. Number two. In an orderly disposition and ranging of his temptations, beginning with little things first, and then by degrees working over to greater. His first emotions are commonly most modest. Genesis 3, verse 1. Should he discover the depth of his design at first, it would startle the soul and make it reply as Haziel, Am I a dog that I should do this? It is far easier to gain his end, a little at a time, than putting for all at once. Number three, in endeavoring to engage the soul upon his own ground. I mean to tempt him from his station and duty where God sets and expects to find him. He knows while you are with God. God is with you, Second Chronicles 15, verse 2. Whilst a man abides there, he abides with God, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 24. Whilst he is there, the promise is a good breastwork to keep off all his darts. And therefore, as fishermen, when they have spread their nets in the river, beat the fishes out of their coverts and caverns, so also does Satan. Number four, in not presenting the temptation till the soul be prepared to receive it. He loves to strike when the iron is hot. He first lets their troubles come to an height, brings them to the prison, gibbet or fire, and then offers them deliverance, Hebrews 11, verses 35 and 37. Number five, entiring our souls with a long continuance of temptations. What he cannot win by a sudden storm, he hopes to gain by a tedious siege. Forty days together he assaulted the captain of our salvation, Mark 1, verse 13. And truly, it is a wonder the soul yields not at last, that has been tried for so long, when the rod of the wicked lies long upon the back of the righteous, it is much if he put not forth his hand to iniquity. Number six, and falling most violently upon them when they are lowest and most prostrate in their spirits and comforts. So he assaulted Job with the temptation to curse God and die, when he sat in that deplorable state upon the dunghill, Job 2, verses 8 and 9. He loves to fall upon us, as Simeon and Levi did, upon the Shechemites, when we are sore and wounded, 
and therefore ordinarily you find times of divine desertions to be times of diabolical temptations, so that look as the wild beasts of the desert come out of their dens in the night, and then roar after their prey, Psalm 104, verse 20. So does Satan when the soul seems to be benighted and lost in the darkness of spiritual troubles. And this is the second thing in which the efficacy and strength of temptation lies. Lastly, it lies in that secret correspondency Satan holds with our bosom enemies. Were it not for this domestic traitor, he could not surprise us so easily. As you see in Christ, he could do nothing because he found nothing to fasten the temptation upon. He was like a crystal glass filled with pure fountain water, so that though he should have been agitated and shaken never so much by temptation, yet no filthy sediment could appear. But now we have an enemy within that holds intelligence with Satan without, and this would prove a devil to us if there were no other devil to tempt us. It is the fountain of temptation in itself, Matthew fifteen nineteen, and the chief instrument by which Satan does all his tempting work, Second Peter 1, verse 4. Our several passions and affections are the handles of his temptations. Everything, says Epictetus, has two handles to take it by. Our affections are the handles of our souls. The temptation of self-confidence and pride takes hold of a daring and forward disposition the temptation of apostasy upon a timorous disposition, and so on. These inbred lusts go over to the enemy in the day of battle and fight against the soul, First Peter 2, verse 11. This is a more dangerous enemy than the devil. It is true they both work against us, but with a double difference. Satan works externally and objectively, but lust internally and physically, i.e., as it is capable of physical efficiency. Satan wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, Romans 7, verse 8. Yea, it is a subtle enemy that does his business politically, Romans 7, 11. Sin deceived me. It betrays with a kiss. Drangles with a silken halter, Hebrews 2, 12, Ephesians 1, verse 22. These are his agents sitting at the council table in our own breasts, and they are carrying on his designs effectually. Yea, it is a restless and perpetual enemy, no ridding your hands of him. Satan is sometimes put to flight by resistance, James 4, verse 7, and sometimes ceases his temptations, Luke 4, verse 13. But when he ceases to tempt and inject, this does not cease to irritate and solicit. Where we are, it will be. It is our sad lot to be tied to it and perpetually assaulted by it, Romans 7, verse 24. We may say of it, as Hannibal said of Marcellus, that it is never quiet whether a conqueror or conquered. Yea, it is a potent enemy too. It holds men away to the commission of sin. James 1 verse 14. It seizes the magazine of the soul and delivers up the arms, I mean the members, to be weapons of unrighteousness. Thus, you see, wherein the efficacy and power of temptation consists. And it mightily concerns you that are or expect to be sufferers for Christ to be acquainted with these things, and know where the strength of your enemy lies. But how shall the suffering saint so manage himself in a suffering hour as not to be captivated by temptations? This brings me upon the second thing I promised, namely, to prescribe some rules for the escaping or conquering of those temptations that are incidental to a suffering state. First, Labor to cut off the advantages of temptations before they come. It is our inordinate love to life, estate, liberty, and ease that gives the temptation so much strength upon us. Do not overrule them, and you will more easily part from them. Revelation 12, verse 11. O oh, mortify self-love and creature love. Let your heart be loosened and weaned from them, and then the temptation has lost its strength. Rule number two, secure to yourselves an interest in the heavenly glory. When once you clearly see your propriety in the kingdom above, you will set the lighter and lower by all things on earth. That is the pregnant text to this purpose, Hebrews 10, verse 34. It is our darkness and uncertainties about those that make us cling so fast to these. Number three, settle this principle in your heart is that which you will never depart from, that it is better for you to fall into any suffering then into the least sin, Hebrews 11, verses 24 and 25. This all will acknowledge, but how few practice it. Oh, that you would practically understand and receive it. 
Suffering is but a respective external and temporal evil, but sin is the universal, internal, and everlasting evil. Number four, believe that God has cursed and blasted all the ways of sin, that they shall never be a shelter to any soul that flies for refuge to them. Mark 8, verse 35. Proverbs 13, verse 15. The way of transgressors is a hard and difficult way. There is no security in the way of iniquity. He that runs from suffering to sin runs from the seeming to the real danger, from the painted to the living lion. Number five, Live up to this principle that there is no policy like sincerity and godly simplicity. This will preserve and secure you when carnal wisdom will expose and betray you. Psalm 25, 2, Job 2, verse 3. Sinful policy never thrives with saints. Number six, consider sadly what the consequence of yielding up yourselves to temptations will be. The name of God will be dreadfully reproached. 2 Samuel 12, verse 14. A fatal stumbling block is laid before the blind world. The hearts of many upright ones are made sad, Psalm 25, 3. The fall of a professor is as when a standard bearer faints, and a dreadful wound it will be to your own conscience, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7, Matthew 25, 6. One hour sleep of security may keep you many days and nights waking upon the rack of horror. Number seven, never engage a temptation in your own strength, but go forth against it trembling in yourselves and relying on divine aids and assistances. What are you to grapple with spirits to enter the list with principalities and powers? Or what is your strength that you should hope? Number eight, let the days of your temptations be days of strong cries and supplications. So did Paul in Second Corinthians 12, 8. Your best posture to wrestle with temptation is upon your knees. Number nine, dwell upon the consideration of those choice encouragements God has laid up in the world for such a time. As first, though he gives Satan leave to tempt you, yet you are still in his hand to preserve you. That while Satan is sifting and trying you on earth, Christ is interceding for you in heaven, Luke 22, 31 and 32. That an eternal reward is laid up for those that overcome. And now is this reward to be won or lost? Lastly, be content till God open a door out of your temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. The time of the promise will come, Acts 7, 17. Wait for it. Though it tarry and seem to be deferred, in the end it will speak and not lie. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. There is a secret door in the ark, though it could not be seen whilst the waters prevailed. And so there is in all your temptations, though at present it be not discernible by you. And thus I have brought you one step nearer to Paul's blessed frame. O give diligence to make yourselves ready for sufferings.